Hello, my name is Jeffrey Pogue, and today I'll be performing Thomas Paine, The Most Influential Men in America, A Key to Understanding Revolutionary Communication. <sighs> Thomas Paine, my once good friend, is dead. I'm glad you've all joined me here today. Benjamin Rush, George Washington, John Adams, you all were greatly involved in periods of Paine's life, so I thought we could come here and share a drink to his incredible legacy. A man who, even with the independence of our country at stake, was able to utilize influential writing to help propel the American colonists to victory in the war for independence, while also helping to shape our early American ideologies. As we look through Paine's work, his communication serves as a key to understanding the capabilities of persuasive writing, as well as the origins of our American society. Would any of you like to start? Ah, Benjamin Rush. The floor is yours. You know, I first heard about the man through the word of you, Benjamin Franklin. When we first met, Payne and I shared such similar views on so many topics, and with you as a mutual acquaintance, why, we became good friends. He truly was a remarkable man. If I may, gentlemen, I'd like to share one of my favorite stories on Payne and one of his greatest achievements. Now, I know it would be a lie to say that Payne was the first man to suggest independence from England. By 1775, many of the colonists were up in arms about the unfair taxes and the Boston Massacre. But you must admit, the majority of the population was still unsure whether to fight or to remain under British rule. Sure, Payne and I both knew that independence would be the only answer, but how could we convince the people of this? It was I who thought to write a letter to the people, inform them of the evils of England myself. It was a good idea, but you see, gentlemen, I was in charge of a successful medical firm at the time, and having seen death threats sent to previous authors who proposed independence, I knew I could not risk my career in this manner. But Payne, Payne believed that independence and justice was above this risk. And so, at my suggestion, combined with Payne's history for incredible rhetoric and skill with the pen, Payne started to write. And when finally he finished, he came to me with his new pamphlet, a plain truth. I see you gentlemen are confused. This is not the title you know Payne's pamphlet for. It was my suggestion that changed the name to what you all know it for today, Common Sense, a pamphlet fighting not only for freedom from England, but also defining the values of our country. And what a magnificent creation that was. At the time, if you told me some pamphlet sold 4,000 copies, I would have called that a success. But common sense, that sold over 500,000. That is a copy owned by every one in five colonists, my friends. And its impact, that too was incredible. It completely changed the tenor of the nation from one of docile innocence to one of patriotic revolution. I'm sure historians in the future will look back and call common sense the clarion call which began the revolution and the urtext of American democracy, for that is what it was. It single-handedly rallied a nation behind the beliefs that freedom was worth fighting for, laying the foundation of our nation's core beliefs. I cannot imagine another man having such a profound impact on a nation as my late friend Payne did. And for that, the man is a genius. So I'd like to propose a toast. A toast to Payne, the father of the revolution. Washington, you knew the man as well. Why don't you share? <laughs> It's true. Before falling out, I used to consider Payne a friend, if only out of necessity. It was a good story, Dr. Rush, and if I may, I'd like to share one of a similar breed. Imagine, 1776, I am the general to the Continental Army, and here I met Payne for the first time. He was a skilled propagandist who shared my goal of independence, and therefore he was of great use to me. You may think me cold gentleman, thinking of a man only for his skills, but his use was so great, and our need even greater. Nevertheless, Payne joined my army in 76. But Payne was not a soldier, oh no. We took him off the battlefield soon enough and made him a secretary. But my men, they were not doing well. We faced heavy losses at Fort Lee and Fort Washington at the hands of the better trained British. I knew these did not matter. The British could take our land, they could take our cities, but as long as my men could persevere, we could make it through and win the war. But even this was becoming harder. As 77 approached, entire regiments were deserting left and right. My men were hungry, they were starved, and beyond anything else, 
they were hopeless. And yet, as we camped for those cold, wintry nights, there by the light of the fire, motivated by the despondency of the men around him, sat Thomas Paine scribbling away. And on the 19th of that December, Thomas Paine published what would be my saving grace, what he titled The American Crisis. It was a masterpiece of imagery and patriotism mixed with spirit and fury. To call it a pep talk would be an insult. It was more than that. It was art. The words were so powerful. I had them read to every man in my army. And that night, among the starved and the despirited, wearing the legendary words, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in the face of crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of every man and woman. And not three days later, invigorated by the empowering wars of the American crisis, my men set off across the Delaware and won two of the most important battles in the war in Trenton and in Princeton. Adams, it was you who said, without the pen of pain, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. And to this I wholeheartedly agree, for pain made my men want to fight again. Without these texts, our independence would simply be an asterisk in the history books. So, I too would like to propose a toast to pain. To pain, the savior of free America. John Adams, why do you look at me so? What have you to say? Ah, uh, yes, Thomas Paine, the uneducated lower classman who rose to stardom as my political enemy. We all knew the man. He was arrogant and he was pig-headed. I found his radical stances preposterous and his attacks on religion blatantly offensive. But, men, strike me dead if I am not impressed by his abilities. I'm sure you all are all well aware of how hard it can be to communicate across one state, let alone 12 of them. But Payne, Master Payne, thought ahead and sold his pamphlets for only a shilling apiece, far cheaper than the norm. Because of this, it became plentiful enough for the colonists to share amongst themselves. And this was not even Payne's greatest feat. I'm told the illiteracy of the common folk runs rampant nowadays. How is Payne supposed to write to those who cannot read? Yet leave it to the master of communication to answer that as well. He wrote in a form of prose each line carrying a punch with spirit and fury so that people could read and would read his poetry off on corners in taverns like this one so that even the illiterate could be enwrapped in his politics. Unlike other polemicists of the time, Paine wrote with short sentences and simple words so that the low and high class alike could be enwrapped in his politics. Paine made, made politics available to the common man and beyond that, he made politics seductive. He knew his audience and used this as a key to understand how to communicate and reach far more than could have been thought possible. I said it once long ago, this time truly was the age of pain. So, despite my misgivings, I'll give a toast to the man. To pain, a master of communication. Franklin, that leaves you. What have you to say on the man? <sighs> Payne was a complex man, to be sure. He could be arrogant, he could be stubborn, even radical at times. But he truly was a revolutionary man, and we must honor his incredible legacy. A man who crossed an ocean from England and not two years later changed the beliefs of a society he barely knew. When once I told the man, where liberty is, there is my country. Payne, always quick to the response, replied, where liberty is not, there is my country. Payne knew justice and liberty better than any man and was willing to fight for it at all costs. Suffice to say, our country was truly changed by Payne's communication, down to its ideological roots. I'm sure that years in the future, great politicians and progressivists alike will look to Payne's writings and and ideals and be influenced as much as those who read it when it was first published. A wise man said, Paine stands more than any other as the father of the American school of political philosophy, as he certainly is the founder of the creed of the American. For Paine showed that true communication is limited by no bounds. Class nor country, not even a literacy can stop true persuasive communication. And so for this, 
I would like to give one final toast to pain for all of us. So men, to pain, the most influential man in America.